Good morning, everyone. Can I have your attention? Oh, this is so exciting. We have such an incredible crowd. Thank you so much for being here this morning to induct the 2010 class into our Athletic Hall of Fame. Uh, before I get started, I just want you to know we're webcasting this, uh, this event across the country, and I'd like to say a warm hello to the alumni everywhere and a very special hello to soon-to-be Hall of Famers and their families that couldn't be in attendance today. It's an extraordinary day. Today we enshrine our highest achievers in our Hall of Fame and celebrate the pride and traditions we hold so dear in college athletics. The College at Oneonta Hall of Fame exemplifies the greatest athletic triumphs in our university's history and also allows us to celebrate the leadership of men and women of vision that, ha that have led us to this place in time. A special congratulations to everyone on the stage today. The college was established in 1889 and it's recorded that in the spring of that first year, our students organized an athletic association for baseball. 21 different athletic teams grew from there and have been woven into the fabric of our university's history for the past 121 years. Today we honor and recognize another class of self-starting individuals who embody the value-driven skills so evident in the college athlete. You will be awed by their accomplishments. But before we get started, I want to thank the Hall of Fame Committee for their dedication to Oneonta and their year-round service to make this event happen. A special thank you to Jeff Hazard, our Sports Information Director, for his leadership as Chair of this committee. To Brian Jester, our Associate Athletic Director, for his attention to detail in coordinating this event. And Drs. Klinuski, Dr. Perry, and Dr. Ingersoll for their commitment to a winning experience for all of our student athletes. It's my great pleasure to introduce our president, Dr. Klinuski. Thank you, Tracy. Good morning, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to assist in honoring our new members of the SUNY Oneonta Athletic Hall of Fame. Joining me on the platform today are Hall of Famers and longtime coaches, Don Flewelling and Don Ball. Welcome back. Also with us today are several other Hall of Famers, and I would like them to stand and we'll recognize them all at the end. They are Malcolm Ted Bears, 1968, Garth Stam, Keith Benjamin, 72, Michael Pasiant Luck, 85, Alex Brannon, class of 82, Ronald Megan, 67, Don Jester, 57, Kramer Harrington, 59, Kristen Marullo Shearer, 91, Vince Fody Sr., 57, and George Wetmore. Please recognize all of these past Hall of Famers. Thank you. Division III athletics is all about dedication, pursuit on the field, or in the pool, as the case may be, in the classroom, and long after graduation. This year's class spans 50 years in the college's history. It includes all Americans, all conference, all state, and all region athletes. It includes multiple time SUNYAC champions, NCAA and ECAC tournament participants. Some of these athletes still hold school records in their sports, which is amazing. At Oneonta, our athletic program emphasizes service to the college and the community. And this class exemplifies that service. Represented here are leaders in education, and business, community, and civic-minded leaders, and respected residents of Oneonta. Dick Burr and Jim Baker spent more than 60 years combined at the college, 
and Alicia Tall Lang, who currently is an assistant women's soccer coach, carries on the tradition of service to SUNY Oneonta. On a personal note, one of this year's inductees has a lucky number. Brendan Heslin wore number 10 as a baseball player, and he is being inducted in the 10th month of 2010. I'm honored to share the platform today with all of these new members of our Athletic Hall of Fame. Please give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Good morning. It certainly is always an honor to be here because it's just such a wonderful event. And for the student athletes who are here today, we certainly thank you for for sharing in this day because we know that there are Hall of Famers out there and someday you will be up here and we will be saying congratulations to you as well. So I want to thank all the student athletes for showing up today. It is certainly an honor to serve as the chair of the Hall of Fame committee. Uh, the meetings are lively at times. The discussion uh, of who was the great athlete and who wasn't uh, and who should be in the Hall of Fame and, it's, and we always get it right. We always get it right. And this class is we're getting it right still because this is an incredible group of student athletes. So I would like to uh, begin today's ceremony by bringing up Hall of Fame swimming and diving coach Mr. Don Ball uh, to take care of the presentation for both the 66 and 67 swim teams and also Sandy Jones. I want to start by saying thank you, thank you, thank you to Gary Holloway, who was instrumental in nominating this group and this individual, and to the selection committee, and to the alumni office, and to Tracy, and to Jeff, and if you don't know their last name, you don't know Oneana Athletics. I know that a lot of other people were involved in this. I was a little bit involved in the search, and we're fortunate to have this representation of the team. They come from a lot of miles away. The one person who reacted the quickest to the invitation was Art Holman, who lives in Australia. He came all the way back just for this. And the primary part of this for him was a reunion of what we had back then. The, the friendships, the interactions with it and team, and not so much to be awarded for achievement. And we had two individuals come from Alaska for the same reason. When they were contacted, they said, you know, it's a real busy time for us. We're preparing for winter. <laughs> but they're here. And of course, we've got people from Virginia and a couple in and all over New York State. And uh, we're, we're real happy. I'm real happy to have them back. And we've had a wonderful, wonderful reunion so far. We spent from about noon to five o'clock yesterday at my home with half of the group and then after dinner last night some more time and, and they didn't talk about their achievements as you know of some of them now when they say All-American and Conference Champ and that type of thing they, they talked about the relationships uh, on the team and they talked about people who didn't achieve a great deal, people who had no background in swimming before coming here, they trained just as hard as the rest of them, uh, they didn't score points unless we put them in an event where they had a sure third place because there was no entry against them at that point. <laughs> and they, they spoke more of these people than they did of themselves, and it just indicates the closeness of the group and how they depended on each other at the time. 
these guys competed back in 66 and 67 and you you've got a, a program that lists some of their achievements but they represent the bulk of the team represents the first team ever at Oneonta State this was in 1963 so that was 47 years ago and I know there's some young athletes here and they're looking up on stage and they're saying who are those old guys <laughs> were they really athletes here and 47 years ago how old is the school anyway <laughs> well we're somewhere around 120 years that's that's one third of that time but students here at the school as they look back at you they're saying are they old enough to come to school are those high school athletes out there and and so the generation gap exists so we're reaching back to try to identify and and uh, and give some recognition to this team and so we have a good representation here what we're missing three of us who passed on but they're here in spirit and we'd like to recognize them Ryan Ahern Diver Dan Ryan Freestyle. Mike Christie, freestyler. I'm going to uh, read off their achievements because, uh, oh, I, I don't think that they're all included. And uh, we, we did reach back and, and try to uh, focus on the, the total achievements. And I may not even have <laughs> my list here. One of the one of the achievements, and it, it came out last night at the dinner. Uh, apparently, Cortland has become a pretty good rival. Is that right? In in the conference, and of course we just won two games yesterday against them. And uh, when people were introduced, they said they graduated from Cortland, and, and uh, there were comments made about, well, that's okay, we will excuse that. And uh, one of the first achievements of this team would be the first team in this conference from Oneonta this includes the whole athletic department to defeat a team from Cortland. And that's a, an interesting story. Uh, we went over there knowing that we would probably lose. And so we got together and we spent hours looking over the lineup and somebody came up with a, a unique idea and that was to put a person who never competed in high school and was our slowest swimmer at the time into the 200 yard butterfly now half of our team can't swim two lengths butterfly that's that stroke where you bring your arms out this way and after about five strokes you can't get your arms out well we looked at the rules and we did a little creativity with the rules and this person went in and we talked to the officials and told them what this person was going to do they agreed that's within the rules this person swam with two officials walking and and that person was swimming outside lane right below the officials and they studied the stroke all the way it was legal all the way but it could have easily broken and this person because he was entered in that event got one point 
And so a non-recruited athlete, wasn't an athlete at that time, won the meet for us 48-47. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> That's the guy that did it. <laughs> John Orzel, and uh, I'll, I'll tell a little story. I was going. Uh, John Orzel in high school could never go out for athletics because he was allergic to his own sweat. Can you imagine that? He not only broke out in a rash, but he broke out and bled. And sometimes when he walked to school, he had the reaction and had to turn around and go home just from walking to school. He missed a great deal, and he had to make unusual adjustments in his life because of that. I, I can't imagine being in high school in that situation. When he came to Oneana, we had a swimming requirement, and we had to test everybody in the school to see if they could swim. And he was there, and I commented about his breaststroke kick. And I said, we're starting a club. This was in 1962. You want to come out? And, and he couldn't believe it, that a coach would ask him to come out for athletics when he couldn't touch it in, in high school. And we've had recent conversations on the telephone. He called back and he says, Coach, I got to talk to your team. He says, your team changed my life. Not the ability to swim in a pool without sweating and it washed off and he, of course, didn't break out. But it was what happened within the team that he was the slowest swimmer and yet he was treated just like he was an All-American. He was important to the team for his contributions that he made in relation to the team. So I think I would stand up, John. John Orzel. So we, we have conference champions up here. Oh, yes, John. Thank you, thank you, John. We were the first, of course, to have a conference champion, individual champion. We were the first to have a, a unbeaten season, a perfect season. They were the first to have a conference champion uh, team and they did that more than once. Uh, we've got a number of All-Americans sitting here. We've got a, all, a number of conference champions here. And we have one national champion sitting up here. It's been said that the, the, the will to train is more important than the will to win. And in, in trying to develop a program, we felt that continuous training and frequent training, morning workouts and afternoon workouts, two a day, and some training over the long holiday of Christmas was important, so we were the first to take a southern trip. Roger Bannister was the first to break a four-minute mile. The very next year, others broke the four-minute mile. So something happens when you, 
when you break a mark like that, something happens to other athletes, as has happened here. So that's been repeated here many, many times. Conference championship wins, All-Americans, training trips south, that sort of thing. And uh, so this team feels that they contributed in some way to the success of what you have today here. I made a comment the other night about what I learned from them, and one of them quickly said, well, what do you mean? We learned from you. And I said, no. I said, one of the most powerful coaching tools that I discovered came from you. When somebody completed a race, I was there at the finish, and they expected what we called splits. What was their time for each length of the pool? Because that pacing was important in their success. So I showed up expecting to shake their hand, say congratulations, and especially when they did their best time, when they broke a record. And I also anticipated them reacting in a way, boy, wasn't that great, I finally did it, coach. I, uh, I'm on a day off of practice, and, and they didn't. On the way back from the finish line to the bench, they were saying, coach, did you see my turn up there? I kind of missed that turn. Did you see that I shouldn't have taken that extra stroke? Did you see I took a breath off the turn? By the time they got to the bench, they were telling me what they did wrong and what they were going to do better next time. I nourished this a little bit and used it as a tool. Self-criticism, self-instruction and improvement come a lot better than when somebody comes up and says, here's what you did wrong after your best performance. Here's what you did wrong. That doesn't work, but when it came from them, it did. I, when I stood up here, I, I said, I can't do this. Uh, it's going to be difficult because I have analysis paralysis. I have too many things to to say them uh, about them in a short period of time, and uh, I, I, I don't know where to start. And we're given a very short period of time here, and so we have to pick and choose. Another thing that we remember about the team is that it wasn't the coach that planned the meets, it was the team. They came over at night, spent two, three hours over a pizza, and all the combinations that we could put together against the other team. If I give you a combination lock and say, here's three numbers, figure it out, it would take you hours. Well, they had about 40 different slots they had to figure out, the combinations. And we left there, with three different lineups. And if this team did this, we'd use this lineup, this team did that, we'd use this lineup. And many times we had to meet in the office, but as a result of their input, we won a number of games or, or meets that we shouldn't have won. And so I'm, I'm grateful for the return and we spoke last night of having another reunion. Now, it's been 45 years. And uh, one of the guys made a motion that we try to have the next reunion a little bit earlier than 45 years from now. And we discussed that, and uh, the motion passed. But. Gentlemen, we're, we have a new team. And
and most of these guys are retired now, some aren't. But we're in a give back part of our life. And you can be in Australia, you can be in Rochester, and you can be in Alaska and, and be a participating member of the team. But I want you to remember that walk back from the finish line so that when you are kind to somebody, you walk away feeling, and not patting yourself on the back, but you remember the walk from the finish line to the bench and say, I could have done better. When you join a service club or give back to your college or give back to your church or your community, don't pat yourself on the back. Try to determine how you're going to do better. And so I want to introduce you to, or I want to call up Malcolm Bears, who was one of the captains of the team. And Malcolm is his official name. His, our name for him was Ted. The girls called him Teddy Bear. <laughs> Ted? First of all, let me say, I'm certainly not going to speak as long as Don. Uh, I don't do very well up on this side. I'd rather be sitting out there listening. Anyhow, one of the things that came up last night when we were sitting around talking was the fact that uh, somebody leaned over to me and said, you know, when we were back there, we weren't really impressed with what we were doing. I mean, we won conferences and we set records and it wasn't any big deal. We just didn't think it made such an impact on enough to get us uh, here so that this whole team is recognized and being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, there's lots of stories I could tell you about it. We had lots of fun and we worked real hard. I mean, uh, Ron and I started out in 1963, and we survived uh, four years of Don's torture in the pool. Uh, and I mean getting up in the morning, getting up the hill, swimming in the pool, and you, I can still remember saying, Don, the water's cold. We don't want to go in swimming. He says, you got a mile to do. It's your choice. You know, you got an 8 o'clock class. And if you want breakfast in between, you better get in the pool. <laughs> and repeats and just the general workout. A lot of people thought when we went to Florida, we spent all our time on the beach. No. We spent a lot of time first thing in the morning in the pool. And I remember the first one, the, uh, what did they call it, Ron? The casino pool? 50 meters. Salt water chlorine. First thing in the morning. No goggles. They didn't have goggles then. Uh, which means if you wanted to, to not run into a turn or run into the wall, you had to open your eyes in the salt water to find out where it was. I think it was the next year they had this nice, beautiful pool. Was it? Yeah, it was the following year they created a pool right behind it called the Hall of Fame pool beautiful thing. Uh, we spent a lot of time there. Of course we spent time on the beach, but I can also remember going down to practice in our sweats because it was like just above 35, 36 degrees in Florida. It was cold and we had to get in the water and swim. Anyhow, let me present the team. no name on this one. It says Team of Distinction, Don Ball, Head Coach. Well. 
This one's to me. Kimbler. Thomas Hanley. Art Holman. <laughs> Steve Johnson. And ugly. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Robert Sandy Jones. Did you a kiss? No. Sandy was the other co-captain for this team of that 1966-67 year. And in case you're wondering, Sandy and I call each other ugly all the time. I forget his name's Robert W. Jones. I've just referred to him as ugly so long that... And it fits, I think. Uh, Doug Maycumber. And uh, my co-conspirator, Ron Megan. And from my hometown, uh, Bill Nettles. Pat Siganoffi. And last but certainly not least, John Stamm. At this time, we're going to call Don Ball back up to uh, present our individual from that team, as we mentioned before, uh, Sandy Jones. So, Don. Ted Barrett was our national champ, by the way. And um, Dr. Klinuski is a swimmer, too. <laughs> I've seen her training out at the uh, uh, Fox Center. Sandy Jones was a three-time All-American and conference champion. He was on undefeated teams. He was co-captain more than once. And when he started out here, he was a great athlete. He had skill as well as all the other attributes. And then he wasn't a good athlete. And then he was. And 
sometime during the early stages of his swimming career, after the first year, he was an intense trainer. Uh, and he came to practice and eventually he wasn't performing as well. And he was leaving practice, uh, supposedly to go to the restroom, but three times in an hour and a half. And it's normal for hard training athletes to regress before they get better because of fatigue and overtraining. But there's something else going on here. His, his complexion wasn't the same, and yet he kept driving himself, thinking that tomorrow is going to be all right. And he didn't talk to me about any of his problems. So eventually we sent him over to the campus doctor, and he got a clean bill of health, came back. And still wasn't functioning right, still looked worse. So we called his mother. His mother was a nurse, and we said, hey, this, something's going on here. We don't know what it is. He went home, and his, his mother, uh, I think, worked for a cardiologist, and Sandy was training under the influence of strep, which is a no-no. And if you train with strep, you can develop heart disease, which he did. And the doctor indicated to us that he was in such a stage that he could go to bed at night and never wake up again. So his therapy was to stay in bed. He had to lay down and be in bed 12 hours a day. And he wasn't supposed to walk upstairs. He violated that a little bit, but he was very careful on campus. This took over a year for him to get back to the point where he could train again. My thoughts were, oh, heart. If he comes back, he's not going to be the same person. If he takes a year off, he's not going to be the same person. And he went through that year, and the doctor gave him a clean bill of health, indicated to me that he could train again. And so he started out a real good athlete. He spent a year not a good athlete, and then he came back. And my attitude was that, good, he's back. He's doing what he loves to do, but he's not going to be a conference champ. He's not going to be the first place on the team. And, and yet we wanted Sandy. And so he did. Now, his, his dad used to say, I know his dad very well. I, we have a camp not far away from where Sandy's is, where dad lived, and I, I've known him over the years. And he was an intense person himself. He was a high achiever on the world status in carving and art, different things. That he passed, he passed on things to Sandy. And he would say, uh, hmm. Hmm. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're absolutely right. And whether you think you can is better. And I just imagined him at that time, because I know his personality, that's what he told me. But I can see him saying, you're my son, and you better think that you can. Now there's a story about a football player that's true, but I can't identify the team, the person, or anything. But this football player was on a team, a starter, and he played every game, did it well, uh, played the whole game. 
And one day he just outplayed himself so that everybody recognized it, the spectators, the coaches and everything. And it was an impossible sort of thing. And the coach went out to him and says, what, what, what happened? How, how come today you're playing so well? He said, Coach, he said, my dad came to every game in high school, he came to every game in college, and he died last week, but he was blind. He said, this is the first game that he's seen. Sandy's dad's funeral was Tuesday. And he's with us today, Sandy. He's got the best seat in the house. And he's very proud of you, just for sitting on a stage. And his family is here, his brother, his wife, grandchildren. So, smile, Sandy, because he's with you today. Sandy was a self-motivated person. I didn't have to do anything at any time to try to push him further. The team helped, but Sandy pretty much did it by himself. I want to present Sandy Jones. I'm going to have to, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how I'm going to be able to talk after that. <clears throat> but it's very nice to be back to Oneonta. And um, I really sense an energy in this school. And congratulations, you have really brought this, this Oneonta's back, I think. Um, I was so happy to be here and so honored to receive this recognition. But I think I'm even a lot more happier to see my old teammates that some of, some of them I have not seen for over 45 years. We had a lot of special things going for us at that time. The state university system was growing and the state was plowing a lot of money into the state university system so it was like a no-brainer to go to a state university school. They had new facilities. Teachers wanted to come here to teach, so we had some of the best teachers, the most inspirational teachers that one could ever hope for. Oneana is such a college-friendly town. You just felt a warmth when you walked on campus or when you walked downtown. Uh, it was just a wonderful place to be. Uh, and, well, it did have more bars than any other town in New York, I think. And the uh, the male to female ratio was, I think, three to one at the time. Um, and we had exceptional support from the administration at the time. I think our athletic director was Hal Chase. And uh, so we had, you know, just we had a lot of things going for us. And I think um, we had a wonderful group of sports writers. And sometimes they get overlooked, but they sure made us look good. And, um, but the, I think one of the things that was remarkable about our, um, some of our swim meets is that you had to get to our swim meets early because they were always standing room only, which is, I think, very unusual for a swimming event. I mean, in high school, we swam with a, just a deck around the pool. Here you had a grandstand. And I understand that there are plans in the works for a 50-meter pool with a big diving well. And you know, I think I want to come back here and swim again. <laughs> I mean, that, 
That is really going to be inspirational and something really to look forward to. Um, and I think uh, we had a very inspiring, helpful, friendly, handsome, highly motivated, gentlemanly uh, team who extruded sharp wit and dry humor on almost every occasion, sometimes when you didn't even want it. Uh, some extremely talented young men at the time and very entertaining and fun to be around uh, teammates. And I really appreciated being counted a member of their group. Oh, um, yeah, we, um, we also had a coach. Uh, <laughs> Don was a very special and inspiring coach and has become a, a lifelong friend. Uh, he actually wasn't much older than we were at the time. And, um, but he quickly convinced us that he knew what he was doing. And anyone who could convince us to do, to train and push ourselves the way he did, he has to be a good motivator and a leader. He is an ex, this is kind of technical, stay with me on this. He is an exical technician. His biomechanics were excellent. He's a tactician when we would prepare for teams or for meets. Uh, he had a, a very in-depth knowledge of kinesthetics, psychology, and he had a training philosophy. And I think he gave us a lot of other philosophies as well. Uh, and um, he had a clear vision of how to motivate us to succeed. Uh, he actually made individual plans for each of us to improve and to be successful. He had very good judgment. Uh, he married a very intelligent, well-disciplined, attractive, and supportive wife. Uh, Marilyn is the strength and good sense, tolerance, that helped Don have a successful career and family. The power behind the throne. <laughs> She's right there. <laughs> Well, Don helped us achieve uh, more than we ever thought we could. He pushed us pretty hard, but it really wasn't always easy for him. He endured long, uh, arduous recruiting trips. Uh, he was there to open the pool. He was there whenever we wanted to train. He was in the pool, or not in the pool, but he you know, opened it up for us. And um, it was just not just not two or three daily workouts. I mean, we worked out more like five times a day. He endured a lot of abuse from the team. He, uh, when we didn't want to practice, we played ultimate frisbee with the kickboards. We bounced on the trampoline. We took part in uh, one of Ron Megan's water shows. Uh, we locked the coach in his office. We, well, you got to picture this, okay? We're uh, doing repeats and we're getting a little tired of this. And um, so Ted Bears gets up on the pool deck, walks around behind Don, picks him around the stomach. He's holding two Bolivar stopwatches in his hands. He's fully clothed, picks him up and throws him in the pool. <laughs> then, of course, we got to throw him in the pool every time we won, and we won a lot. <laughs> so. One morning when we were training in Florida, and uh, we didn't feel like early morning workouts, uh, we actually tied him in bed. <laughs> so, but uh, I think the thing that was remarkable about all of that, it was all in good fun, but that you know some coaches would have an ego and they'd let their ego get in the way of that, but Don took it all in, in, in stride and um, with a good sense of humor, and I, I think he endeared himself even more to the team, uh, and we worked all the harder. So, so with Don, all of this rigorous and, and kind of tough training, you know, we learned that we could do a lot more than we ever thought we could. It became fun and we will remain a time in all of our lives. 
that we'll always cherish. And I'm really thankful for this honor and thankful for being here today. And I think Oneana is looking like it has a very bright future with some really top-notch leadership. Thank you very much. At this time, it gives me pleasure to uh, bring up our next presenter for a student athlete who I had the pleasure of watching uh, patrol the outfield for us in baseball for a few years and, and certainly very deserving. So I'd, at this time, I'd like to bring forward uh, Brendan Heslin's dad, Mr. Tim Heslin. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning. The first indication we saw of Brendan's love of baseball was when he was two years old, hitting a wiffle ball with a fat bat to his grandfather. At age six, he would tag along with his older brother, Tim, to Little League practice. Often the coach would let Brendan practice with the team. At the age of nine, when he was old enough to play Little League, his previous exposure to Little League made him one of the more experienced players in our area. I had the pleasure of being Brendan's Little League coach for four years. I encouraged him and several other players to play many different positions on the field. This diversity helped Brendan earn many honors through his years of playing baseball, beginning with Little League. As a teenager, he played every level of high school baseball, where he learned many different aspects of the game. In his sophomore year, he made the varsity team and was chosen the starting center fielder. While playing for Binghamton High School and American Legion Baseball, Brendan played center field, pitcher, and catcher. He made all-conference two years in a row, American Legion Post 1645's Player of the Year, New York State Class AA First Team, and USA Today Honorable High School All-American. College was the next step for Brendan, and he explored many options before deciding on Oneonta State. His main goal is to become a teacher, and Oneonta State has a wonderful program for education majors. Not only was Brendan able to earn his bachelor's degree in education, elementary education, and begin courses for his master's, he had the opportunity to play baseball during his four years at Oneonta State. Once again, his play and love of the game earned him many honors as all SUNYAC and all region three times, ECAC Upstate New York All-Star two times, and finally NCAA Division III First Team All-American in his senior year. In 2002, Brendan was chosen to be a member of the SUNYAC All-Star team that played in the Collegiate All-Star Tournament in Moscow, Russia. Brendan's awards and honors caught the interest of many major league teams. He was invited to free agent tryout camps and had personal tryouts with the Chicago White Sox, the Cincinnati Reds, and the Atlanta Braves. Brendan was entered in the 2002 Major League Baseball Amateur Draft with the possibility of being drafted by a Major League team in the latter rounds. This is where his dream of playing in the majors would end. Brendan was not drafted that year. He was disappointed, but he felt that God had a different plan for him. He was hired by the Susquehanna Valley Central School District as a fifth grade teacher. He was named a modified baseball coach and modified girls basketball coach. Brendan is a gifted coach who has been respected by his players. He has the ability to teach his teams the skills they need to play the game. And he has been told several times by his parents that he taught their children the true meaning of sportsmanship. Coaching was put on the back burner two years ago when Brendan and his wife Rachel became the parents of Brady, who was showing some of the same skills his father showed when he was his age. Brendan and Rachel are anxiously awaiting the arrival of their second child in February. Brendan has given my wife finally and me many reasons to be proud of him, both at and off the baseball field. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you for the selection of the Oneonta State Athletic Hall of Fame, our son, Brendan Heslin.
That's going to be tough to follow. <sighs> Just give me a second here to get some. All right. All right, first and foremost, I would like to congratulate my fellow inductees on their induction into the Oneonta State Hall of Fame. You all had truly remarkable careers, and I am honored to be a part of the 2010 Hall of Fame class with you. I would like to thank the College of Oneonta, the Athletic Department, and the Hall of Fame Committee for selecting me as an inductee into the Hall of Fame. I am honored and humbled and extremely proud to be in the Oneonta State Athletic Hall of Fame. My career at Oneonta definitely had some ups and downs. Following a very successful freshman season, I pulled my hamstring six games into our season on our Florida trip and had to sit out the remaining four games so it could heal. In our second game back north that season at Frostburg State, I suffered a season-ending shoulder injury while diving headfirst into third base. Then in my redshirt sophomore season, I contracted mononucleosis just before our conference schedule began and missed half the conference season while recovering from mono. If it wasn't for my family, coaches, and teammates, I'm not sure how I could have gotten through those two seasons. I have a lot of people I would like to thank today, beginning first with my teammates. Without these guys, I would not have been able to achieve what I did. Every day, whether it was practice, off-season workouts, or game day, we pushed each other to make us the best ball players we could be. I developed several friendships while I was here at Oneonta that I will be forever grateful for. So to all my teammates, thank you. To my coaches, I want to thank you for pushing me to be the best ball player I could be, especially Coach Virchin. Coach, I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to play center field and bat leadoff for you right away as a freshman. I want to thank you and the athletic department for applying to the NCAA for a medical redshirt for me when I suffered a season-ending injury my sophomore season. I also want to thank you, Coach, for setting lofty goals for me my senior season. I can remember talking to you in your office about what numbers I would need to attain to likely become an All-American and how confident you were that I could do it. Well, I attained those goals and because of that season I had, I was named the Male Athlete of the Year in 2002 and the first first team All-American in Oneonta State baseball program history. Coach Virgin, thank you for everything. I want to thank my trainers while I was here at Oneana, Tom Benoit and Andy Spence, for all their hard work, especially in rehabbing my injured shoulder. We spent several hours together for two months doing all sorts of range of motion exercises, TheraBand exercises, resistance exercises, strength training in the pool, light weights, and monitored baseball activities like swinging a bat and catching a ball, all in an effort to make my shoulders stronger. Their hard work allowed me to come back pain-free and was a big reason why I was able to have such a successful career here at Oneana. Thank you, Tom and Andy. <laughs> Finally, I want to thank my family. It's my grandfather, Pop. Excuse me. Pop passed away when I was 12. I want to thank him for all the hours he spent pitching the wiffle ball to me in his backyard when I was a young kid. He was probably the first to begin shaping and developing my hand-eye coordination. To Stacy, my sister, thank you for being such a great sister and someone I could talk to about how to balance school baseball, and other aspects of life. To Megan, my twin sister, thanks for being my number one fan. I could always hear you when I was playing. 
I also want to thank you for helping me through block while playing baseball. Without you, I do not think I could have made it through that semester. To Timmy, my brother, thank you for letting me tag along with you when we were younger. I was so lucky to have an older brother who didn't mind having his younger brother around. Also, also thank you for all the batting practice at Rock Park growing up. You truly helped shape my swing. To my parents, I want to thank you for being the best parents a son could ever ask for. Mom, thank you for teaching me how to be successful in life and how to be a good husband. Dad, thanks for being the best coach I ever had. <laughs> Excuse me again. <laughs> Even while I was in college, no one knew my swing better than you probably because you constructed it. You never said no when I wanted extra batting practice and always knew what to say to me when I was struggling. To my wife, Rachel, even though you never got to see me play one inning of baseball, <laughs> I'm glad we could share this moment together and with our son, Brady, who's around here somewhere. I'm not sure where he is right now. I want to thank you for sacrificing family time so I can spend time at the ballpark and coach, and for becoming a baseball fan. I know that's something your father is very proud of. <laughs> I'd like to leave you with a quote today that I heard when I was in high school and helped drive me to be the player that I was. Vince Lombardi said, and I quote, the dictionary is the only place that success comes before work. Thank you and congratulations again to my fellow inductees. These are great days. These are great days. Congratulations, Brendan. At this time, it gives me pleasure to bring up a Hall of Fame coach in his own right, Mr. Don Fuelling, to present Dick Burr. story. This is a tough assignment. Uh, I'm greatly honored today uh, to introduce to you Dick Burr. I'm under a lot of pressure. Uh, he's my co-worker for 50 years almost, but he's my friend. And when we're talking about this day for him and the pressure I'm under because of he is my friend, so I'm going to try to present him in a very positive way. There were days uh, when he was director of admission that he wasn't my friend all the time. And I'll get into that in a minute. How do you talk to, about a man who's put in 50 plus years of excellence in all phases of his professional and personal life at this college in just a couple of minutes? Well, I'm going to give it a shot. Many times we tried to get this Hall of Fame going back in the 70s and 80s and every time we tried to do it, it wasn't something that was very important to people. But we kept at it. And once I was given the okay in the mid-90s to get this thing kind of off the ground because we're putting a new building in here, I started to think about who should be on a committee to look back at the history of our athletic program here. And there were two guys that came immediately to the forefront of my thoughts. One was Vince Foti, and the other was Dick Burr. And then when we got the committee going, we had many, many meetings. We went to many different colleges to check out their Hall of Fames. And so today, we're going to put Dick in. Dick was a high school athlete from Walton High School. He came here in 1958, graduated in 1962. But Dick was a track athlete in high school, a 220 sprinter and a pole vaulter. And when he came here, there was no track team. So we played a little baseball for Hurley McLean, 
graduated in 1962, went on in 1963 to Geneseo as an intern, came back here in 1964, and at the age of 22 years old was hired by then President Netzer to be one of the first full-time faculty administrators in the history of the SUNYAC conference or the SUNY system, 22 years old. Within a few short years, Dick became director of admissions, and that was in 1976. And he had an admission philosophy that I got to know quite well over those years because at that time I was a young coach here and was starting a program here that we were going to try to make successful. And I think any coach knows that if you don't have support across that street over there, you're not going to go very far here. The administration calls the shots, as they should, and you had to have people in administration that looked upon athletics as being part of the total education picture. And there were times during some of those years, and, some of, and Dick may allude to this today, that our philosophies didn't mesh. Dick outworked people. He was a workaholic, that's what I would call him. He was a lover of statistics. He had a photographic memory. He's super intelligent. He had a great memory for, for names and places. He also could remember how to get to schools in New York State that I'd never heard of. He knew how, where, where to go. I can remember many times he would bring faculty members along to go to college nights. We'd go all over the state. And I could tell you some great stories about those days when we didn't have a lot of money. And so we'd have eight or nine faculty members all trying to figure out who was going to sleep in the bathtub on the road because we might have only had one or two rooms. One quick story to tell you about how he remembers things. I was going to Long Island to visit a recruit, and I was in his office getting ready to go, and I was getting directions because I knew he knew exactly where I could go. And we talked about the young man I was going to recruit, and he said, yep, his sister went here, his father went here, uh, his brother's going here, uh, they live on such and such a street, and the dog, his name is Butch. <laughs> and sure enough, when I went to the house, Butch was the first one to greet me. Dick wanted to get to know all the students here. And that is why almost every night when he left work here, he would carry 70, 80, 100 applications home with him. And he'd be home till midnight reading those applications because Dick wanted to get to know every student here. He knew every director of guidance in the state. He knew all students with talent. And I get a kick out of this. I, I remember, uh, as the basketball coach, you know, what I wanted. I wanted great athletes who would become great students. Dick wanted great students that would become great athletes. And we had fun with that, going around for that many years, let me tell you. Dick was not a taker. Dick was a giver. And how many events that this gentleman has seen over the years, over his 50 plus years at the college, how many different events he's been to to watch student athletes play, whether they be a women's field hockey team, a women's soccer team, my basketball team, the swimming team, whatever it was, Dick was there. And the students knew that. I could remember every time I came into the, the old gym over basketball game, I could tell you right where Dick was sitting and where Barb was sitting. So he knew the student athletes. And he loved the student athletes. He's a winner. He cares. I think, in my personal opinion, he was underappreciated for all the things he did here. Dick loves Oneonta State. He still, to this day, can be seen at most every soccer game there is here. He and Barb are the two best fans we've ever had. When I started this a couple of minutes ago, I said, how do you honor a man who's put 50 plus years of his life in our athletic program? And you honor him by putting him in the Athletic Hall of Fame. Mr. Dick Burke.
It's going to be a tough introduction to follow. Thank you, Don. Oneonta has been my home for more than 50 years, and I've got some absolutely fantastic and wonderful memories. But this induction, without a doubt, goes right to the head on any list that there could ever be for my memory. I'd like to thank the Hall of Fame committee for selecting me for this great recognition. I'm honored and humbled to be joining such a select group of individuals who performed so well and represented this college in the athletic program. When I entered Oneana in the fall of 1958, it was a vastly different institution than it is today. There were a handful of buildings, Old Main, Bugby, the Home Act Building, the Heating Plant, the Bacon, Morris, Denison Complex, and that fall we opened Wilbur Hall. That's it. There were all of three athletic teams, baseball, which played down on Webb Island, basketball, which played in the Armory because we had no athletic facility on campus, and a newly instituted soccer team that was still in its infancy. Following graduation, I had the opportunity to attend graduate school the following year. In the spring of that year, while I was completing an internship at Geneseo, I became aware that there was an admissions opportunity at Oneana and came for an interview. And until this weekend, I think my greatest memory of Oneana is sitting in Dr. Netzer's office and being offered the opportunity to come back and work at my alma mater. I was all of 22, and there weren't people under the age of 30 without experience. I think I could have walked to Geneseo and not have known to get back to my college, and I was so proud to be employed here and to spend my career here. College obviously grew very quickly. Within a period of several years, we opened basically this upper campus. In the space of two years, we opened nine dorms, two cafeterias, and all of our classroom buildings. And with that came the opening stages of our current athletic program. We went from those three sports to about 20 sports overnight. And I think it was the vision and foresight of Hal Chase who had a lot to do with that. Hal was the director of athletics and because we had a relatively small admission staff, we frequently had faculty and staff travel with us. And I can remember probably my second year, Hal was in the car and we were driving probably to his beloved Buffalo area. And he was talking about the State University Athletic Conference and his dream that Oneana was going to become an athletic powerhouse. And he was talking about a meeting where the administrators had decided they were going to award an all sports trophy to the SUNY College that had the best athletic record. Now this was something because the SUNY Athletic College then, as it is today, was one of the most competitive Division III colleges going. Back in those days, it was a college division. And most people were skeptical about the ability of Oneana to achieve anything resembling the winning college for the All Sports Trophy. But Hal set out to hire a faculty and a staff who were not only going to be coaches, they're going to be leaders. And if you look out in the hall, you're going to see four All Sports Trophies. Nobody in their right mind would have guessed that. But Hal made it happen. He hired great coaches who were concerned not only about winning athletic events, but about having students who could go on and be successful in life. And if you look around you, you're going to see a lot of examples of people who have been successful. And I think we're approaching that stage where perhaps the Commissioner's Trophy is going to be headed to Oneonta. Last year, we had three teams get invites to postseason NCAA play. I don't think there was another Division III college in the country that had three at-large bids. We didn't get them because we won conference championships. 
We got them because we had super teams who played difficult schedules and performed very well. And the other night when I was looking through the commissioners listing from last year to see where Oneana stood, trying to calculate what we'd need to do, and as Don alluded, I love statistics, although I wasn't very good in math, <laughs> so maybe my math is a little off here. But I think if each one of our teams this year can finish one place higher than they did last year, we're going to be this close. So maybe one team can finish two or three places high, and there's going to be a commissioner's trophy joining those all sports trophies out in the lobby. One thing Hal did that I think I'll remember him for forever, above and beyond all of the things he did for athletics, was whenever he hired a new coach, he brought them around to the office. And I think obviously his motivation was to encourage us to get to know them and perhaps admit one or two athletes who were right on the border, whether they should be admitted or not. But he encouraged those coaches to stay in contact with us. And they did. And I'm very, very pleased that all of those people, past and present coaches, have become friends. So it's not just a case of knowing them as coaches, but the respect they give me and my wife when we ask them questions about how are your recruits or how are the injuries, what's your upcoming schedule, what kind of strategy you're going to use. The time they spend in providing those answers makes watching a game or an athletic event so much more understandable. We're still not experts, uh, but we think we're getting there and we're understanding the game a whole lot better. So I'd like to thank all of those coaches and the athletic administrators such as Tracy, Bart, Jeff, Brian, and people like Jimmy Weir and Frank, people who go out of their way to make us feel welcome when we're on campus. I don't have the time in the speech to acknowledge and thank all of those people who have been helpful during the course of the years, but there are two people in particular who spent enormous amounts of time helping us in the admissions effort. And I like to at least mention their names and acknowledge all they did. One is Carrie Brush, and the other is last year's honorary inductee to the Hall of Fame, Vince Fodi. When we attend an athletic contest, it's always easy to look out on the field and see plays, and you wonder what you just saw. And to have someone you can nudge on the side, and did you believe that official missed that call? Although we might not say it in quite those words. Um, I remember there was a basketball game down in Bristol, Tennessee a few years ago. And at the time we had, I think it was nine freshmen on the women's team and they were playing an event. And early on, the other team was just getting every call imaginable. If there were 20 calls, whether it be a possible travel or a charge or a block, I think probably 19 and a half of those calls were going for the other team. Somebody had to speak up, and so from the crowd, there was something to the effect that these players are out there for both teams busting their hump, and you officials need to join them and make this a well-refereed game. Interestingly enough, fans from the other team spoke up and said, you're right. And interestingly enough also, the game suddenly became a better refereed game, and uh, Oneana came back, and while they didn't win that game, they did win the following day. Always a pleasure to go and watch our Red Dragons, men and women. The thing that has been particularly pleasing to me has been the fact that when I turn to that person next to me, for the last 43 years, I've had the same person by my side. When she met me, I think she knew I liked sports, but I don't think she had an idea she'd be traveling all over pretty much every weekend following teams. So for all the support she's given me, I'd like to thank my wife, Barbara. And for those of who know her and do see her around later today, you could wish her a happy birthday because it is a memorable day, I think, for more reasons than one for her. I'm gonna remember this induction forever. And I thank everyone. Good luck to our teams this afternoon because that sets us on one more step on that commissioner's trophy.
This is amazing, isn't it? It's just amazing. Um, to the student athletes that are here, thank you so much for being so attentive. I am so proud of what we're doing this year and how you are taking such an interest in honoring those who came before you. I hope it would be okay and you'll give me the privilege to indulge. I'm going to take off my athletic director hat right now and I'm going to be a coach. I was a coach here for 16 years as the women's soccer coach and I'm really going to try hard to get through this speech but I am a coach right now and I am so psyched and so proud that the Hall of Fame committee would do the right thing in acknowledging the induction of probably one of the very best soccer players certainly that I ever coached and that we've seen here at Oneonta all of these years. Her name is Alicia Tull and myself and my wonderful husband David who I've had the privilege to coach with all of those years both had the privilege of coaching Alicia for her four-year career. Alicia was a goalkeeper and the first time we met Alicia I watched her in an indoor soccer game her team lost that game 8-0. to zero. And what was remarkable about that game that sticks in my mind as it was yesterday is that there were probably more than 100 shots taken on her in that game. The team wasn't that good, but she as an individual athlete was absolutely sensational. Her skill set was the best we had ever seen and I was a young coach at the time. I was only at Oneonta for the first six years. But we knew if we could get Alicia to come, we could start something really special. Like many of you out there that are athletes right now, I know that you had lots of opportunities to play in Division I and Division II. And that scholarship is that thing that says, geez, that must make me good. Well, Alicia came to Oneonta for all the right reasons she might say it's because David said we'll take you even on one leg and I have to tell you the story about that Alicia in her senior year of high school had an ACL tear and she was being recruited by many division one programs but we were just on her like white on rice and never stopped calling her and said we want you whether you're hurt or not we know you're going to make a difference for our program and we're really excited that she and her family decided that Oneonta was the right choice the women's soccer program had its first varsity season in 1986 here at Oneonta and many soccer programs that we played against had long been established already. So we were the new kid on the block. In the conference, when Alicia first st stepped out on the field in a Red Dragon uniform, in the sport of soccer, anybody who plays soccer out there knows that the goalkeeper is a paramount position, OK? The skills of the player playing that position are going to dictate the system that you play, the style that, the play, that you play, and the risks that maybe your team is going to take or not throughout the game. We now had a goalkeeper, Alicia, and now Dave and I had to find players to complement her skill set. That took time, but what was interesting and what was fascinating from the very first time she stepped on the field was that people know it was going to be hard to score against Oneonta. You were going to have to be better. Alicia took us to postseason every single year that she was here. She took us to the ECAC championships. She took us to the New York State Women's Collegiate Athletic Associ Association tournament. And especially, she took us to our first two NCAA births. Remember, we were the new kid on the block. And I need to take you back to the very first game we went to the NCAAs because we have some baseball players in the room. And I know that their hair is sticking up on the back of their head when they remember this is the very first time last year in the history of the baseball program that they went to the NCAAs. Nobody cares how you got there. You got there. And that was what happened to us in 1997. Well, let me just tell you, the hairs on the back of my head standing up right now thinking about that very first time. I want everybody to have a first time like this. We go up to Nazareth. I'm sure Dick Burr was at the game <laughs> with the other 10 people that were watching that game. Um, 
Nazareth was a real formidable opponent and had been to the NCAAs before. And I need to tell you, as much as we prepared our team, we were a deer in headlights the first 20 minutes of the game. Breakaway after breakaway after breakaway. It literally could have been Nazareth 6, only on to zero in the first 20 minutes of the game. That's how unsettled the team was. What was Alicia doing that whole time? She was diving and saving the entire crowd for Nazareth, who had been completely um, negative against us, completely changed their entire tune and said, oh my God, this person is going to just save this team. Well, long story short, uh, that's the one and only time in my entire career, 16 years, that I actually sat down on the bench. Not because I felt de defeated during those 20 minutes, but because I was in awe of witnessing the athleticism of this young woman saving this game personally while we were trying to get our act together. I wish I could say we won that game, but we went into overtime with Nazareth and we lost three to two and that's where the history began. We started to believe that we could actually win. People then started to say Oneonta, people could spell Oneonta, and we were on our way. What Alicia started, with certainly the help of a few other very determined players, was a legacy that continues today. The Oneonta women's soccer team has the most consecutive NCAA appearances for every division, Division 1, 2, and 3, both men and women, in New York State, and currently holds the longest conference unbeaten streak in every division, men and women, in the entire country, 101 games. Alicia started both of those records, those records that still stand alone today. She was an all-conference player, an all-state player, an all-region player, as well as, like Brendan, Athlete of the Year in her senior year here. She still holds records that I truly don't see being broken. While, bro while records were made to be broken, it's going to be hard to, to, to actually break a record of career saves with over 460 shutouts, more than 40. She's also been inducted into her High School Hall of Fame and the Section 4 Hall of Fame. Alicia received her degree in math and has been a math teacher and the boys soccer coach at Franklin nearby for many years. I'm so proud that she is currently serving as the assistant coach here at Oneonta and working in our sports information office while she completes her master's degree. An alumni who was one of the most impactful players I ever coached is now recruiting and coaching the team that she made great. Please let me introduce Alicia Tull. First and foremost, I would like to thank the committee for my induction into the Athletic Hall of Fame. I am both honored and proud to be on this stage with so many successful people and would like to congratulate Brendan Dick, Sandy Jim, and the members of the 1966-67 men's swim team on their induction. This is one of the biggest individual honors for me to receive, and it is difficult for me to stand up here as for me, the team was always the center of what I did. And as I speak here today, I can't help but think about the Oneonta State women's soccer team as they take on Oswego, in which a win would clinch another regular season SUNYAC championship, something that I was lucky to be a part of as a player two different times in my career. As I reflect back on the journey of how I came about to Oni attend Oneonta State, I'm amazed at the circle that was created and continues on. I had come to Oneonta many times during the winter months to play in the indoor soccer tournaments that were held in Chase Gym. During one of those tournaments, I got the opportunity to speak with Dave and Tracy Ranieri about their soccer program, about the school, and I started thinking that I could see myself playing here. When I tore my ACL my junior year of high school and opted not to have surgery right away, I decided that Oneana was the school for me in spite of an offer from West Virginia University, as it was far enough away from home, yet close enough I could go home. 
But more importantly, I chose Oneana because of the school and the team had the family atmosphere that I sought, as well as being a competitive soccer program. When I was finally ready to commit to Oneana, I was at the college for another one of those tournaments and can remember sitting in the top row of the not so comfortable wood bleachers in Chase Gym, sitting next to my mom, and I let Tracy know my decision to come to Oneana. Coming to this school and playing for Dave and Tracy was the best decision I could have made. I would like to thank Dave and Tracy for providing me the opportunity and support to play here at Oneana State. If you never had the opportunity to watch them coach together, you missed something special. Their knowledge of soccer was probably only outdone by the passion they had for their sport and the teams they coached. They were able to take a group of strangers, friends, and even enemies and build a team that ran like a well-oiled machine, and we did. It was not an easy task, nor was it an easy journey, but through the discipline, the instruction, and the confidence they instilled, they were able, able to create a group, a team that had a common goal. The skills and values they instilled in their athletes were those that could be carried over from the soccer field to the classroom to every aspect of your life. This has inspired me to instill the same ideals and beliefs in those that I coach. Whether it is the child in the micro soccer program that my husband JJ and I started in Franklin, or the headwaters camper, or the college soccer player. I would also like to thank my family, especially my parents, Garen Buss, as I would not be who I am today or where I am today without their support and love. My family was always very active in sports. Whether it was a volleyball game, a kickball game, or the home run derby in the backyard, we could always be found competing when we had family get-togethers. My parents never pushed me into sports, but did and would do anything for me. When I was 14, I was playing club soccer, was on a summer basketball team, and played on a travel softball team. But my parents not once griped, at least not out loud to me. When they had to cart me from a softball game in Owego to a soccer game in Nandicat on the same day. They were there for all the highs and lows when it came to my athletics. They were first to celebrate with me after a win, and the first to be the shoulder for me to cry on when the game didn't quite turn out the way I'd hoped. They also provided me the support and strength to get through any injury, especially after having ACL surgery. They continue to provide guidance and support as I now coach athletics. Thank you, Mom and Dad. I love you guys. I would also like to thank my husband, JJ. He was able to watch me play here at Oneana, push me through both playing and as I'm coaching, and has pushed me to excel in everything I do. The last group I would like to thank are my teammates, my second family, my home away from home. The bonds formed, the progress that was made, and the success that was achieved will always be a part of our history. This history includes the first NCAA appearance for the women's soccer program in 1997. It also includes giving up only one conference goal in 1999, compliments to my own teammate, Joanne Battaglio. And believe it or not, I can only laugh at her when it happened, and we still joke about it today. When we get together, we still talk about the teams we had and how they affected our lives, lives as if it recently happened. I had the great privilege to play with some amazing soccer players, including Liz McGrail, Megan Harding Benoit, and Joanne Battaglia. It is these memories that were created that will last forever. As we sat in the locker room two weeks ago, just before going out in the field for senior day, Coach McGrail had each of us coaches reflect on our time playing in, on, in an Oneana uniform and what it meant to us. I spoke to the girls about my teammates as my family. We not only pushed each other, but provided guidance for each other. I would do anything for them as they would for me. I always wanted to play as hard as possible for them and would leave it all on the field no matter what so as not to disappoint. The memories that were created with my teammates will never be replaced as a team is simply irreplaceable. Finally, I leave you on this one note, especially you current athletes with this piece of advice. Our lives are not de determined by what happens to us, but by how we react to what happens. Not by what life brings to us, but by the attitude we bring to life. A positive attitude causes a chain reaction of positive thoughts, events, and outcomes. It is a catalyst, a spark that creates extraordinary results. Thank you. Isn't she great? <laughs> well, it gets harder. It gets harder because I have the real privilege and pleasure now to take off my coaching hat and, and talk about somebody that I felt coached me and mentored me when I first came to Oneonta. 
it's going to be my great pleasure to introduce Jim Baker, our last inductee into the Hall of Fame today. I bet most of you in the audience know Jim Baker. You know him as a colleague, you know him as a friend, you know him as a mentor, and you know him as a coach. I am very proud and honored to say that I have worked closely with him for the past 20 years and I have seen and interacted with him in all of these roles. Jim graduated from that other Red Dragon College, SUNY Cortland, in 1965, and he gave us at Oneonta the next 37 years of his career. He's an accomplished physical educator, an extremely successful coach, and there's no doubt that his influences at Oneana have led to the overall departmental success that we celebrate today. His tangible legacy is twofold. First, in physical, physical education, he coordinated and developed minors in health and wellness and sports management, as well as our very popular New York State Coaching Certification Program. These programs are still today very influential in supporting the recruitment of, of our top prospects. If they don't want to be a physical educator, we can get them here because of these minors. And Jim had the fortitude to help us to develop them. He taught multiple courses, is a certified professional ski instructor, instructor and was certified, and he was a certified official in football, soccer, and swimming. He served as the chairman of the physical education department from 1988 to 2002. And during his time at Oneonta, he served in too many capacities for me to list on professional organizations and in state agencies on behalf of the college and on behalf of the athletic and physical education department. Second, his legacy in athletics is exceptional. You might not be aware that he helped to co-found the men's lacrosse program that now celebrates so much success. And also from 1985 to 2002, he was our men's tennis coach. He is, was, and remains the most winning coach in the history of athletics here at Oneonta. He won an astonishing 80% of all of his matches in the 17 year span that he was the men's tennis coach. He was the SUNYAC coach of the year and what makes that even more remarkable is when the conference dropped the sport of men's tennis in 1987, he was forced to play a much harder schedule against private universities and Jim took this bump in the road in stride and went on to win the Rolex Division III Intercollegiate Tennis Championship in 1991, where all the top teams in the country competed. Jim was able to recruit some of the best tennis players in the country to Oneonta, and some of them are in the audience today and have gone on to be very successful. Thank you for coming back for Coach. These might be what you describe as the material, substantial, tangible things over a 37-year career, but for those of you who know Jim Baker, you know I have still yet to touch the surface, scratch the surface of what makes him so deserving of being in our Hall of Fame. I was one of the many young professionals in our department that looked to Jim to gu for guidance, for support, for advice, and for leadership. And he was a true mentor to not just me, but to many other people that are still in the department today. His fortitude, his courage, and his conviction to do the right thing helped to ground all of us as we were growing as professionals in the field of college athletics. He helped us grow. He helped us learn from our mistakes, and he coached us in the same caring way that he coached his successful team. In describing this great man's legacy, and I, and I know I, I, it's hard to do justice to all that he has accomplished, I think Maya Angelou said it best. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Jim Baker was always gracious, always respectful, always with laughter, always thoughtful, and truly a mentor to many of us in this room. Congratulations, Jim Baker. May I please present him to you.
I guess I'm the cleanup hitter. <clears throat> well, Brendan, you're not the lead off all the time. <clears throat> As a result of being the cleanup hitter, almost all of my speech has been taken by uh, prior people, so I'm just throwing mine away. <clears throat> Seriously, I would like to. I'm still in awe over Tracy. I'm trying to figure out who exactly she was talking about when, uh, when we were up here. I'd like to thank the Hall of Fame committee and the college faculty, staff, family and friends, and thank the group that is up here, my colleagues. It continues <coughs> to be an eventful and wonderful journey for me here in Oneana the city of the hills, and I thought I might share with you some of my de <clears throat> developed ideas and lessons about successful team building. There are always teams behind the great teams. You don't do this alone. So let's take a look. My first team was my dad. He taught me <clears throat> early in life to one to believe in yourself and anything is possible. He also took me aside and he told me never be afraid to dream. I had a discussion with my son about this the other day. This is what came to me from my father many many years ago. You must know the rules before you can play the game and win. That has stuck with me every day of my life. He said, study as much as you can about the sport that you participate in or that you might coach someday. But the ultimate saying from my father was, work hard, work hard, and work harder. With these thoughts in mind, <clears throat> my athletic foundation was cast. And I entered into the second team that is important in my life, and that is my family. And I have been blessed with a very athletic family of two children and two assistant coaches, my wife and myself. My son and daughter are both great athletes. Their development and success was my training ground for readiness to become a coach. Often at home, in their growing up, we would have heated discussions. I don't mean normal discussions, I am talking about heated discussions of a type A competitive athlete against a type A competitive athlete. I oftentimes would go to my room open up my closet, get some of my officiating shirts on, put on a whistle, and go to the kitchen table and settle a dispute that was going on in our family. The disputes were always about decision making, fitness, health and wellness, time commitments, academics, multitasking, and all of the elements that went along with good athletes. I enjoyed these. I was at that time developing my strategies and my ideas to become a future coach. This is what I tried to tell them. This was my conclusion within the family. I said, remember, teamwork simply stated is less me and more we. All of their success came as a result of good coaching and a soccer mom. But the soccer mom in this particular case wasn't just a soccer mom. She was a football mom. She was a track mom. She was a skiing mom. And she was a tennis mom. She drove 
thousands of miles. She provided meals. She was up at four o'clock in the morning. That is very difficult for this mom. <laughs> she spent many, many nights talking with me about whether or not our son and our daughter should go someplace to compete or to take a summer program or to go to some glacier in the west coast, wherever the, the case might be. This was the foundation for me and the team, this was the start of the team building. However, one of my experiences that means an awful lot to me is my third team, and that is being the coach of the men's tennis team here at SUNY Oneonta. We had good players, but we ended up with a great team. We had an awful lot of discussions over who was going to be number one on the team, who was going to play number two on the team. And I tried to influence them to under, so that they could understand that it didn't make any difference whether they played one or six, or they played first doubles or third doubles. Every time they won a match, it was a point. As long as you understand that together you become stronger, this is what is important out there, and this is what has allowed us to win many, 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 many matches that we should have lost. What are some of the things that I emphasized within my team? Be smart. You had to have good academics. A smart player always can outsmart another player if you can look for their weaknesses and attack those weaknesses. You have to have a positive attitude about yourself. You have to be ambitious. I gotta speed this up. You have to have enthusiasm. You have to have the ability to change. I used to say this to them every day. You must be willing to change when you're out there on the court getting beat. You can't do the same thing. You must change. And they learned that really quickly. You must be determined. You must have realistic goals. You must make it happen. And I emphasize the you. I, can't, I can only do so much from the sideline as a coach, but you is that, at that participant, you're the one that has to make the difference for yourself. Take advantages of opportunity. They always come up. You have to recognize the opportunity and take advantage of it. You have to have perseverance. There is a statement that I write down all the time. I say this, I say, before the rainbow, you will have to endure a little rain. Very important concept. Don't give up. Quality. Do it the right the first time. If you do it right the first time, you don't have to worry about the second, third, or fourth, or fifth, or tenth time. Do it right. Have loyalty to your team members. I have written down risk. You have to be able to take risk. And that's very important in life as well. Hard work, I'm not going any further than that. And winter, and winners. I don't know how many times I have told this to my players. If you don't hit the target, you don't score. You've got to keep the ball in play. And then I matured a lot over my last few years because we were getting a different type of player. They would always give me an excuse why they didn't do this or why this happened or whatever. Finally, I came to the point 
that I said, no more excuses. I don't want to hear them. I went and took every uniform that we had, and I had silk screened or embroidered on the uniform, no more excuses. And many of the fellows out there now have shirts, and on every shirt, no excuses. I don't want to hear about it anymore. Coaching, as far as I'm concerned, is one of the highest levels of teaching. We do more things, different things, and important things in coaching. You just can't compare them. Real coaching is this. It's making an athlete do what he would not do on his own. And that's a challenge for all of us. And I have a Japanese proverb that summarizes this pretty well. A single arrow is easily broken, but not ten in a bundle. And that's what I learned from this team and the many teams over the years at Oneonta. I have many, many, many hundreds of stories to tell, but I'm not allowed to do that up here. My final team is this, and that is, Don Flewelling mentioned this, Dick mentioned this, and several of the other people that have been here many, many years understands this. Oneonta State Athletics itself, the program, this is the final team. When I first started out, I rated teams politically correct. You were either great, you were either good, or you were challenging. Then I saw a couple of Clint Eastwood movies. And then I decided, I'm not going to be politically correct. You're either good, bad, or you're ugly. I've seen and experienced all of these. And I think that all of the people up here on this stand and many of the athletes that are out there know what type of team you would like to be on and which team you would not like to be on. In reviewing the college's current strategic plan, I pulled this up the other day and I read the first goal in the college plan. And I'd like to quote this. The first goal is to promote a learning center environment that facilitates, and I emphasize the word many, many times, I've underlined it, circled it, and whatever, excellence in teaching, research, and creative activities. This is where our athletic area lies. So in following and incorporating the strategic plan, I have found that Oneonta State's president has developed a vision, a positive philosophy, and more importantly, a commitment to, the, to student athletes and the entire athletic program. From admissions, when a student first enters Oneonta, through the Alumni Affairs Office, when the student graduates and they receive all kinds of in solicitation orders for finances. This college, the administration, the faculty, the support staff, the director of athletics, and all the coaches are now working as the strongest team to better the participants and all programs than I have ever seen in my extremely long existence at Oneonta. I am happy to report that when you look at what makes a great team, you need dependable money streams 
where you have the finances to do the things you need to do. We have that. You need facilities to participate within your craft. We have those. We need a strong and skilled director of athletics. We definitely have that. We need good coaches. We have a lot of those now. They're really good out there. We need good student athletes. I'm looking over here and I see all kinds of good student athletes. But most importantly, because you never have that great team unless you have a total college and administrative support to, to develop good players and good programs. If you have the administration's support, you have the greatest potential of having the great teams. Look around you. You need only to see, as we look around, we see greatness, but you can also feel it around Oneonta. Go Red Dragons. You see dragons all over the place. It's amazing how great it is to see a true red dragon. I will conclude by a statement from an individual that many of you know, and that is Henry Ford. He said it best. He said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. But working together, that's success. I thank you very much. Certainly as we close today's ceremony part of, of, of our day, before we go out to the atrium and unveil our plaques to have forever let these people and admire them every day that we walk in this atrium. And I know that the student athletes and students on campus look at those plaques and they read what's on there. And yeah, it's a few lines, but what we've been given today just lasts forever. So thank you very much to all the Hall of Famers. Wonderful. Uh, we invite everyone out to the atrium now for pictures and the unveiling. And then we're also, after that, we're going to film an episode of Inside Red Dragon Sports where we would like to invite anyone that would like to sit in our live studio audience uh, to watch the taping of that. Uh, certainly welcome to do that. So if we could now just head on out to the atrium to unveil the plaques. Thank you.